Hello, I'm Bruce. Hi, I'm Aditya. And we are the Risky Scientists. I teach risk management at the University of San Diego. And I teach uh, data science at Harvard. And this is episode is of a new type we're offering now. So this is called the, This Week's Risky Wrinkle. And in this quick episode, we're going to try to resolve something dissonant in the news on risks this week. So, yeah, it's a chance to explore what's uh, what's curious out this week and try and um, get a little bit more clarity about what's going on. But, um, Didier Raoul this week, and, and this whole, um, we've heard a lot about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine and whether it's helpful or not. Um, what's going on? What's the story that you've heard so far, Bruce? Right, so this is my understanding. You know, Didier Raoul, uh, essentially described as an epidemiologist, uh, French, born in Senegal, son of a doctor, an MD, became an MD himself, did some prominent work with a geneticist mm-hmm. on giant viruses, and he's made a curious claim about uh, a, essentially he's making a claim that there's a off the shelf cheap cure right. for COVID-19. And then the science has become very controversial. So um, the claim is that he, he, he says that you can take um, an existing treatment for malaria, which is called hydroxychloroquine. Now you, the audience may have heard this, drug discussed a lot in the news because then his claim got internationalized so even president donald trump has talked about hydroxychloroquine yeah um, and Elon Musk. yeah so any any claim of a quick cure is going to go viral in yeah. um social media terms um common treatment for malaria he actually just to clarify he prescribed it in combination with a an antibiotic an antibiotic which was um which is particularly prescribed for pulmonary infection. So antibiotics treat bacteria and this yeah. one, um, azithromycin, I think I said that right, uh, that treats bacterial infections of the lungs and the respiratory system essentially. So that's his claim. So we should talk about the, the science of that. So what did you yeah. read? Yeah, I think um, you captured it well. What I've been hearing is that um, hydroxychloroquine after uh, and chloroquine. Uh, they're both a similar yeah. class of drugs. And uh, hydroxychloroquine, I also want to add, has uh, a lot of immune suppressant uh, properties in addition to potentially uh, malaria, anti-malaria properties, which is why it's commonly seen um, also in treating lupus patients, so chronic immune disease. But I've been seeing that um, uh, as soon as uh, Didier Raoul said this, uh, apparently there was some uh, kind of uh, what I will call tentatively a, a scientific study or an observational study um, that Raoul did to figure out whether um, this this drug was effective or not. Uh, but on further insight um, and further investigation, it, it seems like those studies were um, somewhat unfounded, were perhaps hastily um, published, and um, are now Really not but, seeming to, to hold up. Under I think you're being too generous by saying <laughs> that it's somewhat unfounded. So I think this is this is a risky wrinkle that we can iron out pretty quickly. Yeah. So the the claims from Didier Raoul himself and his supporters we can rule are not scientific. Um, uh, so it's just just we, we, we're going to explore his what he what he offers as an alternative methodology, which is not normative it's not consensual in science uh, certainly not medical science um so just to clarify so my understanding is there have been other trials of hydroxychloroquine so there were 18 independent french tests of the viability of hydroxychloroquine and um, none of them found any significant effects on patients so so, and, and by the way, hydroxychloroquine has a lot of side effects. So this is, in all cases, you want to test drugs in new, if you're, making, if you're advocating a drug in a new way, you've got to test it, you've got to look for the side effects because there might be interactions that um, are more harmful than whatever good it might do theoretically. And it's interesting because um, I think Raul was making the opposite argument that yeah. uh, we should throw out um, a lot of the scientific methodology that's been developed over thousands of years because it um, is too slow and um, yeah. might prevent people who need the drug from getting it. But at the right. same time, um, that also means that people um, 
who could suffer severe complications uh, and side effects, including um, passing away, might uh, might get impacted, and nobody really knows. I mean, there, there's a lot of um, sketchy stuff that I'm I'm seeing in this uh, study, really. And uh, yeah, and, and and to be honest, a lot of it reminds me of of the new norms in social science, where the science has dropped out, and and the arguments against science are based on a sound very like Didier Raoult's argument. So he's, he will, there's some, there's some appeal in this criticism of science. So there are, there are true problems in science. So science is burdensome. So you need a lot of resources to do these sorts of trials properly, which means um, only certain actors like big corporations or governments can do these very burdensome trials. Uh, yeah. long periods of time, big populations, um, control groups, right? Yeah. So, so Didier Raoult makes the reasonably fair point that uh, the, the rigorous type of scientific trials you need in medicine, they reflect corporate and political power. So only, only these resources. Well, it's not uh, just corporate and political power. I think um, he's claimed to have written in Le Monde that uh, it is time for doctors to reclaim their place alongside philosophers and people with humanist or religious cast of mind and get rid of all the mathematicians and weather forecasters. <laughs> we talked about mathematicians and weather forecasters in a previous episode on probabilistic thinking, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's what's concerning is um, that it feels like we're getting rid of probabilistic thinking, going in for surety. Um, and well, that's not to mention... I think he's making a different point there. I think he's making a different point, which is, uh, you know, he's, he's implying that if you are evidentiary, you are removing yourself from the humanist uh, feeling side of yeah. medicine. So, so you should have intuition, you, you, should, uh, you should make compromises, say, in terms of speed, in order to save people now, and not be so wedded uh, to the full scientific process. And he's, he's accusing mathematicians Data, data scientists who, who are strongly behind weather forecasting say, yeah. um, he's accusing them of, of being overly rational and unfeeling, and therefore um, science should be more philosophical. Right, but I mean, I think uh, if I were, if I'm uh, putting myself in the shoes of the weather for, forecaster, yes, of course I feel bad that I'm, I'm saying it's going to rain tomorrow. My, my friend doesn't get to play tennis, boo-hoo. But at the same time, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's my job. And um, I'm saving lives of people who might be trying to go out on bald tires and, and hydroplaning. So yeah. um, I think, yes, uh, sure, some people are going to be disappointed. Um, but we're not talking about bedside manner here. We're talking about scaling massive trials across the country, across the world. Um, and I think absolutely we have to be careful. Yeah, and, then, and there's, we should point out what, what you mentioned earlier about probabilistic arguments, like weather forecasting is always probabilistic. So any, actually any forecast is probabilistic. So you're using past data to, to forecast what is likely to happen into the future. Even if you're almost certain it's going to happen, it's still a probabilistic argument. Yeah. And that's a, that gives an opportunity for a critic to say, well, you don't know what's going to happen. You're just being theoretical. You just, you can't definitely say, but that's not, that's not a fair criticism. Yeah. It's just, uh, you, you, any time you forecast, you're going to be probabilis probabilistic. And there's no shame in being probabilistic. That's, Absolutely not. That shows an honest awareness of the philosophy of argument yeah. and the limitations of data. So what's your take on it? What should we be thinking? Well, um, so I'm going to, so I was always already skeptical of Didier Raoul. Uh, the claims themselves, the claims themselves should not have been taken seriously in the first place. So for, for one thing, he, he, he first posted his claim about hydroxychloroquine on YouTube. Um, he did so in February. So he's not, so he's sort of bypassing the scientific community. So instead of sending out some proposals to, to, to his peers in epidemiology, yeah. and uh, he, he's essentially bypassing them. So it's almost like he already knew that um, it wasn't going to be treated. Uh, his idea was not going to be treated uh, the way he wanted. So he sort of bypasses the community, goes straight to the public, 
by posting this YouTube video. Um, now, later on, on the 20th of March, he published uh, some results of what he called a test of yeah. the viability of hydroxychloroquine. But he put this, again, it's a sort of a bypass of the scientific community because he published it only through his own institute. So he didn't send mm -hmm. it to peers for evaluation or, or ask other people to publish it. It's essentially he's self-publishing this. Um, and there's lots of problems with the method. So, so maybe you can talk about those, the problems in the test itself. Yeah, I think in short, uh, I don't see a lot of evidence of a good control. Uh, so all of this is observational. Uh, that's problem number one. Problem number two is that it seems like many of the, the subjects of um, Raul's test, um, in addition to some potential ethical concerns, we won't get into that now, um, it seems like the subjects um, were, for the most part, on the healthier side of the spectrum. And that's fantastic overall globally, but it's really bad test procedure because uh, what that means is we don't really know whether people are getting better because of hydroxychloroquine or in spite of it. And, yeah, selection uh, bias. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think now there is uh, some evidence maybe from the FDA suggesting that, uh, in fact, for many people, hydroxychloroquine uh, can make things worse because yeah. let's suppose, so if I, if I had to take uh, a kind of make a conclusion on this, I think it's, it's the following. Uh, first, that it's, there's no real clear evidence that hydroxychloroquine works. Um, second, even if it doesn't do any uh, do anything, there are potential harms associated with hydroxychloroquine. And so we have to weigh those harms against the possible ineffectiveness or effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine against COVID-19. Yeah, that's good risk management. So you, you weigh one risk, uh, unintended risk against whatever positive risk you're going to get out of using this drug. Yeah. Right, because I mean, we should point out there was some evidence of misreporting too. So not only was there a selection bias towards healthier people going into the study yeah. there was there was what at least one death and then there were some uh, cases that escalated and they had to be admitted to intensive care and those cases were admitted omitted from the results of the study so this is selective representation of the results but yeah. why would anybody do that because they're trying to make the effectiveness of the drug look better than it really was yeah so it's uh, concerning i think um very inconclusive at best. Um, dangerous is more like uh, more likely, I think. And um, I, I hope that people are able to make good decisions with this. But that's that's my take on this week's risky wrinkle. Thanks for listening. We are the risky scientists, and uh, let us know what you think in the comments below for next week's risky wrinkle. Yeah. Bye bye.